हरि ओम तत्सत वेलकम टू ज्योतिर्मय आनंद चैनल वी फोकस ऑन स्पिरिचुअलिटी अ जर्नी टू सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब फॉर द मिस्टिकल मीनिंग्स ऑफ द स्क्रिप्चर्स एंड डेली सत्संग विद अस वी आर करेंटली इंजॉइंग द बुक द आर्ट ऑफ पॉजिटिव फीलिंग authored by swami jyotirmayanand ji maharaj narrated by myself swami nikhilananda so continuing the story of the fall of king nahush soon after this nahush chose a group of sages and asked them to bear the palanquin they told him they would be happy to do it and smiled knowingly among themselves for they knew what was waiting for nahusha Among them was the great Agatsya, the most exalted of sages. There were others of great standing also. At the appointed time, the sages picked up the heavenly palanquin and hoisted it upon their shoulders for the journey to Shachi. Nahusha sat upon it, bursting with pride as he eagerly awaited the moment when he would claim Shachi as his wife. from the outside however nahusha was annoyed with the sages because they weren't able to synchronize their movements and they moved much slowly than he had expected he suddenly thought to himself lord vishnu's vehicle moves a lot faster than mine come to think of it everyone's vehicle moves faster i made a big mistake to agree to this in his impatience he scolded the sages shouting sarpa sarpa meaning quick quick faster faster move fast his choice of words was most significant in this context because the sanskrit word sarpa has a double meaning it can mean snake as well as quick nahusha's shouts to move faster caused the sages to quicken their pace to the extent that they could but their outpouring of effort and energy still didn't suit nahusha screaming sarpa sarpa at the top of his lungs the king lost his temper and kicked agatsya in the back as hard as he could agatsya immediately cursed him may you become a sarpa a snake so he turned into a snake that instant and fell from heaven down to the mortal world there he remained for many centuries as a snake until he met king yudhishthira at the time of mahabharat war though a snake he was still able to talk like a human being and thus was able to hold many interesting conversations with king yudhishthira because of the contact he had with the great king who was the embodiment of righteousness his spirit was liberated but in spite of this he still had to go through a long process of suffering and degradation before this happened so this story symbolically portrays the rise and fall of ego as represented by nahusha when a person performs sakamya karma or actions prompted by the desire for heavenly enjoyment the fruit he reaps from doing such actions leads him to heavenly enjoyments but enjoying that fruit of righteousness is not equivalent to attaining liberation king nahusha was a great monarch who performed many good deeds but as he we saw simply performing good deeds with no philosophical insight does not eliminate ego and if ego is present there will always be a basis for degradation If you have philosophical insight you do not seek a reward in heaven you seek the dissolution of ego itself you perform actions for chitta shuddhi or purification of the heart not for enjoyment on the astral plane another point illustrated by the parable is that if the unconscious has not been purified if real aspiration has not developed then possessions power and glory all create a twisted intellect if a person seeking purity of intellect attains great power he becomes swollen headed if you cannot handle power you will fall 
and that is what happened to Nahusha also. Shachi is the principle of pure intellect which cannot be owned by ego. Any effort to dominate the intellect by an egoistic process is a movement that will lead one to degradation. Yoking the sages to a palanquin also has mystical significance. When you have not brought order in your personality, it is like a runaway chariot. The chariot of your personality has to be driven by the higher principles of your soul, such as understanding, reasoning and reflection, symbolized by the sages, not by your ego. But instead, the lesser in you tries to dominate the higher. The right destination for the ego is that state wherein it is effaced. When ego allows itself to be effaced, there lies its exaltation, its grandeur. But when ego allows itself to be intensified, degradation results. This seems paradoxical, but therein lies the subtle mystery of mysticism. You enjoy existence more when your ego dissolves. Thus, when Nahusha tried to dominate the sages, he initiated his own downfall. Instead of possessing Shachi, his soul fell into a state of degradation and bondage. Further, the story shows that by adoring Goddess Saraswati, you allow your ego to be dominated by pure intellect. By making you reflective, Goddess allows you to have proper reasoning and insight. If you exalt your ego, however, and live for egoistic values such as power, fame, glory and wealth, then the same Goddess who can enlighten the intellect deludes it. This is the same process that caused Nahusha to fall. The goddess in you is ever ready either to delude your intellect or to enlighten it. When you turn towards egoistic feelings such as selfishness, greed and vanity, the Saraswati within you smiles in a sinister way, causing your intellect to become gradually twisted, demoniac. Though you may think that you are doing good to yourself, you are actually creating a basis for future sorrow. On the other hand, when you follow the path of righteousness and allow good qualities to develop, the Saraswati within you smiles in a heavenly way and your intellect becomes begins to recover its brilliance. You begin to understand the subtle secrets of life and discover the simplest way to transcend all your troubles and turmoils. This is the process by which intellect becomes intuitive. Figuratively speaking, your soul rushes towards the heavenly world. On the other hand, when ego dominates, the soul rushes headlong down into the world process. Moving on to the next topic, insight into humility. Humility is a divine virtue which is the positive counterpart of pride or mother. It is the expression of an evolving soul, a soul that is winging its way to the divine self. Humility implies effacement of ego and it is attained by an individual in gradual degrees. When the mind is highly fulfilled, without the pressure of the unconscious vasanas, subtle desires, ego is transcended and one begins to experience one's unity with the divine self. In that state of perfection, there is an utter absence of ego, a spontaneous blossoming of supreme humility. In the Puranas, there is a story that gives insight into the quality of humility in its highest and most perfect form. Once, gods were having a discussion about who among the deities was the greatest, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the sustainer, or Shiva the destroyer. 
Brahma is the greatest because he is the creator of the universe. He is the teacher of the Vedic wisdom. Being the embodiment of righteousness, he was the guide and guru of all beings. This was the view upheld by some divine beings. Lord Shiva is the greatest because by his immense power, he brings about the destruction of the world process. If Shiva did not destroy the world, the cycle of creation and dissolution could not be maintained. Thus, some argued for establishing the greatness of Shiva. Lord Vishnu is the greatest, asserted the devotees of Lord Vishnu. He is the sustainer of the world. Creation and destruction are sustained by him. It is he who incarnated as Rama and Krishna. It is he who incarnates from time to time to promote harmony and order in the world. Unsatisfied, however, with these answers, sage Bhrugu took upon himself the task of finding out who is the greatest among the three deities. He reflected within himself, I will consider him the greatest who is endowed with the greatest degree of forbearance, who has the greatest control over his temper. With this idea in mind, he first proceeded to Brahmaloka, the heavenly region where Lord Brahma dwells. So we will continue this interesting episode in tomorrow's satsang. Hari Om Tat Sat.